be here, and I want to uh, thank President Park for inviting me. We had a very nice visit with her and her team um, a few months ago in Washington, and I got to learn more about um, uh, Kate Stapp and what's happening here. Uh, we've long been we've long been admirers, followers of Korean S and T policy. We've written a lot of different reports where we often highlight what Korea is doing, uh, whether it's in broadband or uh, uh, telematics, uh, mobile payments, the whole set of areas. So uh, uh, clearly, uh, Korea is doing a lot. Uh, but I think the challenge here for every country now is that uh, everybody's got to step up their game uh, and take advantage of this new system that's emerging, this new technological opportunity. So, um, OK. So I lead a think tank in Washington. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary. And uh, we focus on uh, innovation policy, which means more than science. Uh, science is, is a core component of that. But it's really the application of science, engineering, and technology that really is what innovation is all about. It's one thing to do science. The Russians, for a long time, were recognized as one of the leading countries for science. But I don't think anybody would ever say that Russians were a leading country for innovation. So it's not enough to just do science well. You have to translate that into innovation. And that's really what, what we study and what we write about and what we talk about. So today, I just really, in, in my limited period of time, and I should have some, hopefully some time for, for questions, uh, talk really about five things. Let's we'll start with what, why do we even have innovation policies? Why aren't our conventional science policies enough? And uh, I think there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is that really over the last decade in particular, what you see around the world is more and more countries now have explicit national innovation strategies. Uh, they're wanting to win in innovation. It's about all parts of government all acting and working together. 
So this is just an example of a recent report that we did where we looked at this, this, I, this notion or this concept that agencies, the countries have put in place in the last 10 or 15, 20 years, which are explicit uh, national innovation agencies, uh, or innovation foundations. You can see and now about 49 countries have explicit innovation foundations. Uh, you'll see the country on there, one of the countries that does it the, is the US. Uh, We've actually proposed that. Uh, we proposed that the U.S. create a National Innovation Foundation back in 2008. Uh, and at the time, our main champion in the Senate for that was uh, uh, time Senator Hillary Clinton, uh, who I think you know now is running for president, uh, and in all likelihood will be president. Uh, in all, we should all pray that she will be president. Uh, <laughs> The alternative is not good. Uh, I mean, say that, I don't think it's clearly a nonpartisan, bipartisan agency, so I don't mean to be political here about that. But I say that only in the sense that I think there is an opportunity in the US for us even to create these foundations and these, these institutes to pull together a wide variety of efforts, but all around innovation. So, Given that we're at the Asian uh, Innovation Forum, how is, it, how is Asia doing with regard to some of these issues? Um, the next one. So we've done a, at ITI a number of different reports that rank uh, countries around the world on innovation or on innovation policy. There was one uh, we wrote called the Global Innovation Policy Index that looked at uh, 56 countries on their innovation policies. Uh, this was a recent one we wrote last year, which was really looking at a number of different innovation uh, policy questions. Uh, and I'll just mention a few here as I go through them, uh, and look particularly at some of the Asian countries. Uh, go back one, please. Uh, two more, go forward. One more. Uh, no, you got to go back for uh, Go back for more. Researchers per thousand population, these are just the scientific researchers in the workforce. Uh, now here are Korea, uh, Singapore, Japan, all doing uh, quite well. Top ranking universities, this is uh, in part a little unfair, really should be uh, top ranking universities per capita, but uh, the US not surprisingly leads uh, there, but uh, China, Australia, Korea, Taiwan with other top ranked 800 Government funding of university research, uh, Singapore, Australia, Hong Kong, and 
States. Again, uh, uh, this is an area where a lot of countries are making up ground back in the 1960s. The United States government invested more in R&D than the rest of the world combined, public and private. So think about that. I don't understand why the U.S. has historically had a lead in science and technology and engineering. It's because we had such a giant head start. Uh, we were funding more than anybody in the world combined. Now that's slowed down in the last few years in the U.S. as we've cut budgets. Uh, and other countries have taken advantage of that uh, by expanding their own. Okay. Um, and then government funding of university research. Again, interesting there. If you look at the U.S., uh, only $130 per capita. Uh, U.S. Uh, has been, again, been cutting back on its university research funding, not expanding. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, we talk about innovation industries, uh, and everybody wants to focus on those. But innovation industries are not enough. Uh, everybody wants to get a semiconductor plant, or a biotechnology facility, or the latest software company. Uh, and innovation industries are important, to be sure, uh, but they're not enough. If you want to thrive as an economy in this innovation era, all industries in your country have to be innovation industries. They have to be using and adopting innovation, whether it's just simply process technology through ITT, or figuring out new kinds of business models, or whatever it might be. I think there's a real challenge for some Asian countries where you end up with a dualistic economy, what economists call dualism where you have some industries that are world leaders in exporting and in innovation and competitiveness and productivity, but a lot of other industries that aren't. Um, this was a study on the right by McKinsey, and what it found was uh, McKinsey Global Institute looked at Japan, and what Japan has is they have a few industries and a few firms that are globally dominant, that are doing great, uh, autos being one of them, consumer electronics, but they have a whole lot of industries that lag far behind uh, the U.S. average when it comes to productivity. We see the same thing in, uh, in Korea. Uh, Korean productivity growth in 2000, 2009, agriculture not unexpectedly did well. The manufacturing did very, very well. But then look at the rest, the transport, storage, communication, almost no productivity, negative productivity in finance, real estate, business services. Uh, fundamentally, that's not a sustainable model for an economy. You can't have an economy where parts of the economy are innovating, growing productivity, and parts of the economy are not. Uh, another interesting point there, Korea services productivity fell from 60% uh, of manufacturing in 97 to 60%. So services were not getting productivity growth. Now again, most people, a lot of people, when they think about innovation policy, they're really only looking at a few high-tech sectors in manufacturing or maybe a few in information like software. But that's too narrow an approach, I would argue, for innovation success. The other risk is what economists would call firm size dualism. Uh, this is uh, this a central problem, I think, in a lot of Asian countries where what you have are large firms that are doing quite well, high innovation, high productivity, and they're paying their workers well, and then small firms that frankly are not. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, in Korea, for example, uh, small firms pay uh, about 50% of what, uh, on wages of what large firms pay. In India, it's about 22%. Uh, if you look at the U.S., by the way, it's much more in the area of around 75 or 80 percent. Uh, so this firm size dualism is much more of a problem, uh, I believe, in Asia than it is in, say, Europe uh, or uh, the United States. Um, so it gets to the major point that product innovation is not enough. It's a whole phase of innovation, and we have to think about it both from products uh, as well as services, uh, uh, production processes, but also organization models and business models. You think about a lot of, uh, we heard a little a quote from Klaus Schwab, uh, the World Economic Forum, and what Klaus Schwab is really talking about is technology transforming business models. And I think that's going to be the key to success as we go forward. Uh, we're going to have, 
I think if we do it well, we're going to have a different kind of financial sector than we have now, than we have now through what people call fintech. We're going to have a different transportation sector through transportation tech. We're going to have a different kind of educational system through ed tech, uh, with the rise of MOOCs and massively open online courses and the like. So that's really all about making sure that all of those boxes are filled in, if you will. Um, and then lastly on this, I think nations, uh, particularly again in Asia, risk what you could call innovation dualism. This is a study by the OECD that looked at the percentage of firms that are doing product or process innovation only. In other words, that, that would be kind of more your conventional science and technology innovation. Uh, new technology products, new kinds of technology enabled processes on the shop floor. Um, but then in the orange, it's, it's companies that are doing uh, product or process as well as marketing or organizational innovation. So think about Apple. Why is, why is Apple successful? Samsung is certainly successful too, but why was Apple successful first? Uh, it was really, part of it was product, but part of it was business model. It was about creating iTunes. It was about linking up uh, this whole ecosystem to be uh, a component and a, and a support of the system. That was really a business model innovation that Steve Jobs came up with to complement the technology innovation. And if you look at that, what you see is that um, uh, certainly some other countries, uh, Switzerland and Germany, I'll you know, for example, lead uh, Korea and Japan in terms of their firms embracing all kinds of innovation, not just uh, more narrowly uh, defined uh, technology innovation. Uh, and then lastly, we see the same uh, with regard to innovation within sectors. Again, innovation, to be successful, you need all sectors being innovative. Uh, and this was a study, sorry, this was a, this was a, this was a study looking at what percentage of firms were innovating. And what you find in places like Finland, I think you'll be hearing from the Finnish uh, uh, person later, uh, Netherlands, uh, Australia, what you see are services firms are innovating at a pretty robust pace, yet in Korea and Japan, uh, it's really more dominated by manufacturing firms. So again, innovation is beyond just manufacturing, it's just beyond uh, just products. Okay, so having said that, what do nations need to do to grow innovation industries and, and be able to grow innovation? You know, one could talk for hours and hours and hours on what that look, should look like, and I obviously don't have time to do that, so let me just talk about two things. One is about the role of universities, and I think you can generally uh, pretty much guarantee, no matter what country you're in, universities underperform, given what their potential is to contribute to a nation's innovation system relative to what they actually do. In the U.S., for example, which uh, I think the U.S. has a lot of, uh, we're by no means the leader in the best innovation policies or anything. I'm very happy to acknowledge that. But the one thing the U.S. does quite well is we, I think, have the, we have some of the best universities in the world who link up what they do with the commercial marketplace, whether that's uh, new business startups or working collaboratively with existing industries. Yet even in the U.S., you see this huge divergence between the best practice leaders and average or worst practice. So just look, for example, at in the U.S., 18% uh, uh, essentially of university research funds that do come from industry, uh, about 13, 14% at MIT. Yet you look at a place like Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore, gets just 2%. And that's just one indicator. You see a similar range of performance in U.S. universities and things like how effective they are on creating, uh, enabling startups to come out of university research, uh, how effective they are in working with local industry. And I don't think this is what they say in the U.S. This is not rocket science. This is not that we don't know how to do this. People have been studying this for decades. We know what to do. We know how to do it. The problem is, a lot of universities don't want to do it. They're mo mostly focused on doing research for research sake, and they're not that interested in commercialization. A colleague of mine, Dennis Gray, at North Carolina State University, has long studied uh, for the National Science Foundation a program in the U.S. called the IUCRC program, the 
Industry University Cooperative Research Center program. This program was established in 1986 and works to bring universities uh, and industry together around particular topics, around particular issues. So, for example, at the University of California, Berkeley, there's a uh, microelectronics uh, mem microelectronics mem mem microelectronics machine. Anyway, little teeny sensors. That one center has commercialized an enormous number of businesses in the Bay Area. So these programs can work. And anyway, my colleague Dennis Gray has studied these programs. And what he has found is that there is no negative impact on scientific scholarship in these centers. None. There, so the notion that you're somehow having to sacrifice high quality, world class, peer reviewed science against commercialization or working with industry just is false. Uh, if you do it right. So as a colleague of mine, Lou Tarnowski, and I think he said, uh, Lou and Dennis Gray and others worked on that report, as well as I did. It's an excellent report if you want to look at a guide for your own country of what are the best practices in the U.S. We looked at the top 16 universities in, or colleges in the U.S. that are, that are perf outperforming everybody else on working closely with commercialized technology. Uh, it's called Innovation U 2.0. You can get it on to, I mean, on Google or whatever, you can't find it, just let me know. But that's a good report that really lays out what do all these universities have in common? What are the things that they all do to lead to world-class performance in commercialization? If I were a policymaker uh, in another country or even in the U.S., I would have all my university presidents and provosts read this book, and I would start to rank people and give them incentives to move down that path. The second thing I want to say is about, I mentioned before about how uh, innovation is not just science. And I think if you look at, uh, I, I hate to make broad generalizations, but I will make one. Uh, if you look at, I think, Asia in general, Asia generally has good science, uh, good engineering. Uh, but the real question is, can Asian companies complement that science and engineering talent with the creativity and innovation that you need to be the world leader? That model worked quite well for Asia when Asia was in a catch-up mode, uh, when, when Asia wasn't at the frontier. For most or many Asian countries now, if you're to succeed, you need to be at the frontier and leading the world, not just being a fast follower. So what does that mean? That means, frankly, that uh, Asian nations, I would argue, need to think much more about uh, notions around uh, creativity and disruption. Uh, a colleague of mine um, uh, grew up in Korea, was a Korean student, and she was telling me about being in Korean schools and how the notion there was you, you did well by basically repeating what the teacher told you. And that works well for rote learning, but it doesn't necessarily work well for going out in the workplace and coming up with a crazy, radical, uh, path-breaking idea in your company. So if you want people to be able to do that in your companies, you have to then help people, sorry, you have to then be able to help people do that in your schools. So let me just mention one school, for example, in the US, I think is a real interesting model. Uh, there's a school in Minnesota, a public school called the Minnesota Day School, and it is what's called a charter school. So it's a public school that was set up by, uh, by the community, not, not by the government. Uh, and what this school does, if you look at this school, there are no, it's a high school, uh, and there are no teachers. So there are no classes. So you go four years, you don't take a single class. What you do is all the students have laptops, and they, it looks like an office environment, and they all work in teams on collaborative projects. And then there are adults, but the adults are not up there in front, just sort of spouting off knowledge. The adults work to help these kids develop projects, work in depth to present the project, present the results. And I, I don't argue that that's the model for every single school. But what I do argue is that we need to be thinking about that kind of in institutional innovation uh, to allow uh, kids to be able to really focus much more around uh, creativity. Um, so in other words, the real key here for innovation success is frankly risk taking. 
It's thinking outside the box. It's not just about solving particular problems. So uh, I was asked to just close by talking a little bit about kind of where this whole thing is going to go. We hear a lot of talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I was reading a foreign affairs magazine on the plane right over here, and I was reading one article by, uh, I think it was Fukuyama, who was talking about how in the, we're going to see the end of growth, there'll be no more innovation. Uh, and then two articles later, there was an article by Eric Bernolfsson at MIT about how we're poised for this massive industrial technology revolution like we've never seen before. So we have this kind of weird notion now, I think, in the, in the world where we don't, we don't really know uh, we don't really know what's going to happen. So you have people like Robert Gordon uh, in his book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, who is very, very much about a technology pessimist. But he's, he's a stagnationist. We've picked all the low-hanging fruit. There's not going to be any more innovation. I recently wrote a big, fairly large report slash small book on, on productivity growth and how countries can get more of it. And I read Gordon's book, uh, Cover to Cover, and uh, I really have long been a, a critic of Gordon's work because I don't really think he understands technology. In Gordon's book, one of the things he talks about was how autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars, which eventually will happen, we're, I think, farther away from uh, AVs than people think. Uh, they're not, they still make mistakes, as we saw, unfortunately, with the Tesla the tragic accident. But at some point, we will have self-driving cars, and Gordon says, look, they don't help productivity. All you can do, you might be able to read your email while you're driving to work. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is a study that we did uh, on self-driving cars. And we looked at all the studies and everything. We found that in the US, if we could get to 90% penetration of self-driving cars, we would save the US economy $1 trillion a year. That's a lot of money. And we'd save it largely through reduced accidents and improved throughput on the roads. So the number of accidents in the US, the cost of that in medical, the cost of that in car repair, uh, the cost of transportation congestion, a trillion dollars a year. So Bob Gordon, in his book, he says the economic benefits of self-driving cars is zero. It's clearly not zero. So I think Gordon uh, errs too much on the pessimistic side. Um, on the other side, you hear you have what I would call the techno utopians, people like Eric Bernalson and Andy McAvee at MIT, who argue that this is going to be some unprecedented revolution, bigger than the Industrial Revolution. And I just don't think history works that way. I don't think technology works that way. I think we're much more likely to see uh, something like this. This was a first book I wrote, it was called, it was called The Long, Long Waves of Innovation that Shaped uh, Cycles of Growth. And it was really about how, in a kind of Schubertarian way, if you think about technology, what it really appears to follow uh, are, are these kind of uh, uh, S-curves. And what you have is sort of technology systems that emerge. They think they're going up the S-curve. You have this period of robust growth, lots of investment. People are excited, companies are investing, consumers are buying, productivity is going up, you get more reinvestment, and everything's good. And then you get to the top of the S curve, you've taken a lot of the opportunities already, growth starts to slow down. I think that actually explains a lot of where we are today, uh, at least in leading countries that are at the frontier. Uh, so I would argue we're somewhere akin to um, uh, at the top of that digital electronic technology S-curve, uh, but we're not on this next S-curve yet. It feels like we are because everybody's talking about AI, autonomy, and machine learning, robotics, uh, but we're a long, long way away from those systems really being good enough to be cheap enough and to be effective enough for them to be in broad use. I recently read an article about a restaurant in Korea that has a robot that delivers your food. It's pretty cool, but I, I think we got, you know, that's a nice little experiment happening somewhere in Seoul. If anybody knows where that restaurant is, let me know. I'd love to go see it. But we're a long way away from the system being good enough. And I would argue we're probably 10 years away from the beginning takeoff of that next phase. So for a country, really, to me, it's about figuring out where you want to be in that next 
being uh, weighed. What are the areas of specialty that you think you can be good at? Because that is going to be uh, hopefully the next wave of innovation, investment, uh, and profits. Uh, so whether, whether it's robotics or AI, autonomy, or some other related things, even even in that advanced bio. Okay, so with all that, should we worry about jobs? Yes. And the answer is no, no, no. We should not worry about jobs. Absolutely not. I think that's one of the worst things we can do. And let me be clear, it's not to say we shouldn't worry about individuals who may lose their job and how they're going to get to their next job. But we should not worry about will there be enough jobs. Uh, and I could, I don't really have time to go through that, but let me just say uh, we've written uh, extensively on that. In fact, a large, large report that looked at all the scholarly literature, economic literature on the relationship between productivity and employment. The relationship is essentially positive. So over time and between countries, if you have higher rates of productivity growth, you have more job growth, not less. And that's because higher rates of productivity stimulate spending, they stimulate optimism, everybody's happy, everybody's optimistic, they invest more, and they hire more people. So we really should not worry about that. I think in the US there's a term called it's a red herring. Not sure where that term came from, but a red herring means it's not real. So that's the answer, by the way. No. People don't when 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 you save money by driving an Uber car instead of a taxi. You don't take the money and put it under your mattress. You go and you spend that. And that's what people will do from the savings from automation. They'll spend it. They'll create new things. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that if we could double productivity and if my salary were doubled, I guarantee you that I would never, ever, ever again fly coach because I'm two meters tall. So I would always fly business class. That's where I would spend my extra money. And I'm sure you all have things, if you had double your salary, you would find nothing. You would find infinite things that you would like to spend money on. So I don't think we're, I don't think we're ever, we're nowhere near running out of things that people want to consume, whether it's more travel, uh, a larger house, uh, more education, uh, a cleaner environment, whatever that might be. So, uh, all right, I will close there. Uh, those are we should book my colleague and I wrote for Yale University Press called Innovation Economics and Race for Global Advancement and then the Chinese translation of that book. So uh, with that, thank you so much. And I don't know if we have time for a couple of questions or not. Thank you very much, Dr. Atkinson.